Hey everybody, KC here. So, gonna do something a little bit different today. Um, instead of your usual morning news beat, you know, 10, 12 stories, whatever it happens to be, instead we're going to feature a single interview on a single subject. And uh, what you're about to see is a long conversation that I had with John Grant. And John Grant is the president of the United Food and Commercial Workers, uh, Local 770 in Los Angeles. And uh, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about hazard pay and especially mandated hazard pay. Now, listen, I've been pretty dogmatic about uh, what I think about mandated hazard pay uh, over the last few weeks on Morning News Beat. And listen, most of you, the, the emails I get, you agree with me. I just think it's bad public policy. And I've run nor numerous emails over the past few weeks in which you all have explained to me why you think it's a, a bad idea on a variety of levels. But we weren't really hearing very much from the other side. Occasionally, uh, somebody would write in to say, you know, they were an employee and they felt that they needed to get that. But it wasn't the kind of kind of broad, nuanced discussion of the issue uh, that I wanted to have. Uh, so I reached out to John and asked him if he would come on Morning News Beat and, and talk about it. And he said he would. A um, little bit of full disclosure here. I actually once got a check from John Grant. <laughs> Uh, a number of years ago, he hired me to, to come out and talk not just to people in his local, uh, but people from other locals in California to just give them my insights about the food industry. Uh, and I did. Um, I would say the people sitting around the table, they probably disagreed with 50% of what I had to say. Uh, on the other hand, if I'd had CEOs sitting around the table, they would have disagreed with 50% of what I had to say, maybe just a different 50%. Anyway, so I want to be clear about that. Uh, the other thing I want to be clear about, and, and John knows this because I've told him, uh, I am not reflexively anti-union. Um, my dad was a union member as a teacher, uh, and the health care benefits that were um, negotiated for him uh, were unbelievably great and saw him right through um, uh, till his death uh, when he was in his 90s. Um, I am a, in a union family. My wife and daughter are both members of a teacher's union. And I will tell you, I'm sitting here over the last 25 years. My health care coverage has been, has been basically dictated by um, health care benefits that have been negotiated by my wife's union. So I am not a reflexively anti-union person, despite the, but I am reflexively anti-mandated uh, hazard pay. So we had a long kind of a discussion. We talked about a lot of different things, labor management, talked about the past, talked about the future. I think you'll enjoy it. I learned a lot. And um, I hope it kind of at least sets uh, a floor for the kinds of discussions we can have in the future. You're going to have thoughts about this interview. I hope you share them. And I intend to talk to John and I intend to talk to uh, other people on this issue down the road. So John Grant of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union on the subject of hazard pay. Enjoy. So John Grant, welcome to Morning News Beat. Morning. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Oh, my pleasure. Well, as I said in my introduction, um, I invited you on because I've been taking a, a pretty dogmatic position on Morning News Beat about uh, communities that offer um, mandated hazard pay. And I wanted to talk to somebody who could explain to me why you think I'm wrong. And um, I'm not saying I'm going to change my mind, but I, I think it's really important uh, not to be guilty of epistemic closure. So let's start by talking about just hazard pay in general. Um, I mean, it has seemed to me, and I'm, listen, I'm a, I'm a pundit, I'm a third party, that the food industry by and large um, has done a pretty good job through the, the, the really, especially in the tough times of the pandemic, of sort of recognizing their employees um, through hazard pay, whether it's bonuses or, or, or hourly increases. Is that a fair observation? No. Uh, no. My sense is there was a, um, starting in a year ago, a real reticence around protocols. I mean, they actually told employees not to wear masks, um, sort of fought us. Um, at least I'm, I'm more familiar with Southern California, okay, fair. obviously, than other areas. But I'm, I'm hearing anecdotally through the UFCW across the country. The question of different protocols, the social distancing, the tracing, the contact tracing. I know throughout the country, especially us at 770, had to conduct our own tracing. 
um, of, you know, when someone would get sick. We're the one we pushed for the paid quarantine leave. Um, there, there was some resistance. They eventually the California grocers came in and supported. I mean, I, I got to hand it to the governor. There was a, the first sector wide from the fields to the stores to delivery were entitled to that. Um, and then the hazard pay ended in June, July, you know, and it was, it was signaling, I think, this sort of a letdown um, of attention and consideration. I would, by the way, I mean, I would totally agree with you in terms of what I know about contact tracing. I mean, it right. just seems to me we as a country have not, I've done a terrible yes. job of contact sure. tracing. Yeah. Um, you know, about the, it's interesting you say that about, the, I mean, that surprises me to be perfectly honest about the mask stuff, except that I know in the early days, you know, February, February, 2020, March, 2020, I mean, even Dr. Fauci was saying, you probably want to save the masks for the healthcare professionals. Right. Although by April 1st, I may, by a year ago now, and they were saying everybody should wear masks. I mean, um, so I'm you're right, you're right. That, the CDC, in fact, at one point right. said that yeah. Yeah, they were messing So up. when retailers were resistant to the idea of wearing masks in the stores, um, that was just reflecting what the CDC was saying at that moment. And then, but then as, as they changed or what, you know, still we ended up buying masks for our members okay. and distributing them. And it actually were outside distributing them and got a call from one of the company's labor relations. What are you doing? Raising all this hysteria about, you know, Matt. I mean, it was just, that was one. The other one is testing. There's another area that they were reticent about doing. There were like 20% of a, this is April of employees in a store or higher um, and packing houses was even worse um, that were had tested or were infected. And we say, let's have public t have testing for that store. And they were resistant um, around that issue. I think there was almost a denial in some respects. Now they moved, some moved, some have been exemplars. I think it's Food Max, uh, Foods Co. in Santa Maria. When an employee, two employees being tested negative, they put everybody on two weeks leave two days, scrubbed down the whole store, and then brought in an outside crew to operate for two weeks to make sure that the, you know, to arrest the infection and, and have paid, hasn't paid the whole time, never stopped. Um, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised because the impression I got was that as soon as it starts, I mean, that, that, that certainly in terms of, you know, everybody's plexiglass budgets went off, off the charts. <laughs> Right, I mean, pretty, and pretty early. I mean, they were putting up plexiglass stuff in March and April of, of last year. Aprilish, yeah, yeah, more Aprilish, yeah. And that was there was some resistance around, it. but even the um, the social in August of, of last year, we know customer count was up, sales were out, up, prices in some instances were up, labor costs were down. They actually had, then they were a year earlier when there as was no pandemic. Down as a percentage of sales, though. It, total hours. The week, we got trust fund reports. And they were so, because the two arguments made, one was they were not having the same, which was a, a complete scrum or right. those, those kids younger than us, I guess you'd call it a mosh pit, you know. Um, the sales, March, April, May were through the roof. Right. And, and they then cut back hours, you know, accordingly. And the result was less time to clean check stands, less time to take them. In California, we fought and got protocol. Every half an hour, employees should be able to sanitize themselves and check stand. That was stopped. The wiping down of carts in large part was stopped. And even the social distancing, um, you know, the regulation of, of employees in the, or customers in the store was sort of look the other way, you know, I don't see anything, let them in. And the, and then what happened was by November when the, whether that's the third surge or whatever you call right. it, that was, there was much, in, many infections in November, and December, as there was the whole year previous to that. It was right. just out of control. And everybody had let their guard down, no hazard pay, you know, all that stuff was, oh, it's all, we're, we're done. Oh, it's been, I mean, certainly nationally, we were, I mean, yes. in terms of deaths, we were, you know, at a high point during the, um, you know, during yeah. the winter. Yeah. And winter. what, as we talked before, 
there are two other aspects that, that I should just demand attention. One was this, we call, I call them wooden heads. It's the, way, the least obscene way I could describe them. The anti-maskers who would go in and not just not wear a mask. I can get that a little bit, but then being aggressive and attacking staff, employees for wearing one or for selling. We've had employees spit on, coughed on, thrown objects thrown at them, rammed with a shopping cart where they were assaulted and battered and cut. Um, going in, you know, that was one um, aspect I think that was terrible. And the second one was this, the trauma that they felt where employees would come home because remember in the early days, we didn't know exactly how it was transmitted. Right. They would come home at the back door, wherever, strip down, run into the shower, shower, and then go make two or three trips to the laundromat during the week to wash their clothes. And the sense was, I'm not worried about bringing, I'm not worried about me getting it. I'm worried about infecting someone in my family. And this, and every day it was this question, this medical roulette wheel, am I gonna get infected today? You know, and the, I, we're finding now this trauma is just, is affecting and really causing people to be disoriented. Good people quitting, people paralyzed not knowing what to do. I mean, you know, and you've, I know you've heard of the same. We've had, I mean, I'm now making a call virtually every other week, if not more often, to the family of a member who's died. I mean, and there was no script for that. I <clears> mean, <throat> you can't, you know, um, the members coming, call, we've had calls. We've, one good thing about it is instead of, you know, we're meeting virtually or telephone town halls, We've had 16,000 members on one call to talk about it. We've had, you know, um, psychotherapists talk about it. We've had, we, we retain a psychotherapist. We retain an epidemiologist to help us understand what the protocols are. It is, <laughs> what's so hard about this is I can look out my window and it's a beautiful Southern California day, high 70s. You don't know, that, at least when there was the fire, you'd see the smoke or even during the AIDS crisis, you, someone would, would have some scar, you know, scar blemishes or something, right? You don't know who's, it's like this invisible insidious carrier and it's, but those who, the public places, which I've said before, the only place really that people were able to come to and gather were markets. Right. There was, and, and people would take their kids to the service deli and buy cookies with their kids like that was their excursion for the day and it just was it just is this sense of i mean they would tell me i didn't sign up to be a public health official and now i've got i'm in charge of it and i want to tell this person not to wear a mask and i'm told now by corporate not to get i understand to a certain extent not to get in the middle of it um i had a woman someone came in shirtless maskless and she said please sir i can't serve you and he just coughed and spit on her a week later she gets covid now do i know exactly does she know exactly no but susan hernandez one of our shop stores lives by herself you know what it's just that i can't imagine going to work every day with that you know not knowing this sort of petri dish or medical katrina whatever we want to call it over your head i mean every day you don't know what's going to happen. Has is there a, for lack of a better term, we haven't even gotten into the mandate. Yeah, but let's. Go. Is there a lack of somehow has, has that story? I listen. I've talked to retailers in Southern California, and as you can imagine, they would paint a very different scenario. Right? They would yep. say, "Hey, listen, we did. It. We spent a ton of money on on benefits." We spent a ton of money on 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 um, on salary boost for, for folks. Now, by the way, I I think I said as early as last April when these things started, I can remember saying the the the, the, the companies that were doing bonuses on a regular yeah. basis as opposed to hourly increases, I thought they were smarter because I thought the problem is you do right, you give somebody three dollars more an hour, eventually you're going to take it away, and that's a really bad op optics, right? And you notice it immediately. A bonus is like this extra, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I recognize bonuses are different. If you're getting hourly pay, you're getting it faster than on a bonus. I thought that they could have done things like, hey, listen, we're going to look at that. We're going to look whatever our 
whatever our cops are, we're going to take a piece of that, a percentage of that, and we're going to give that back to the employees. I mean, there were other ways to do it than hourly that might have been easier. But I think that, I mean, by and large, the retailers that I've talked to think that they have, I mean, they have gone over and above. Uh, no, I'm not going to say over and above. They have done what they thought they, they um, I think they would view themselves as having been compassionate and generous and and empathetic to their employees and that um and that they you know and, and that just labor costs are not the only part of this that it's there's also you know there's all the expenses that went into make sure all the stores and all the warehouses and every truck was clean they had to invest a ton of money in e-commerce because that was something that a lot of them weren't had not done before um so there were a tons, tons of expenses that weren't even necessarily related to um, employees and that to paint them as being, and you didn't use these words, but as being greedy or selfish or um, uh, inadequate to the moment it is not fair. And I want, I mean, at some, sometimes I always look at, look at these things I'm saying, is there a communications problem here? Is the problem not, is, is everybody talking by each other? And is the word coming down and going up properly right. in terms of, um, so I would say they probably were those adjectives that you didn't attribute to me. I mean, I would say that they were largely inadequate for the moment. I mean, I also, my understanding is they still garnered exceptional profits. Right from before, even including those costs coming, these right. are after those costs are coming in. The, there's two aspects, I guess. I really think that managers, there is a variance depending on managers and among the district managers above them in terms of how, right. and I, I know, you know, um, which we know is a skill anyway, right. to, to be able to manage. And, and the second thing is I'm not sure that the word went up enough, um, even from the managers as, as to what's actually needed and how People, I, I'm not sure. I think that there've been statements appreciating the work of clerks in the store during the pandemic. I'm not sure that there's an appreciation of the trauma that they're experiencing. It's one thing to say working long hours, you know, yeah. but the tra the trauma I think has added um, a factor that um, is not being completely you know, taken care of or taken appreciated. Yeah. And, and I don't think there's any, I, I, I certainly wouldn't argue with the notion that, you know, um, most food retailers, I mean, if you just look at the numbers and they all have pretty good years, right? They all had, yeah. I mean, if you could, if you could bring merchandise in the back door, all you had to do was open the front door and it was going, right? Yeah, that's and, right. Um, and I think that, but I also think that there's a, um, and, and yeah, they, especially if you're a public company, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of your job to reward your investors, okay? And when, co when public companies have a good year, the job is to reward them a bit more, not less. That's how they would view it. Um, and I think the other thing is though, that if you make more money, that enables you to, um, you can actually take some of those profits and you can apply them to margin so you can keep your costs down, which allows you then um, to compete with Amazon, right? I mean, Amazon's yeah. trying to come, is trying to take away everybody's business at some level. Yep. Yes. And so, and they and they feel this pressure, this pressure, you know, sort of existentially. And so, um, you know, I so I, I mean, I think there's 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 also expenses that aren't even expense lines, right? because part of your goal is to drive down, is to keep, stay competitive as best you can. I would, true, that, but I think in large part, at least from my perspective, um, is the rise in sales and profits did not come from any new innovation or creation. It came from clerks just standing their ground. And I mean, I, I would, my argument to, not argument, my, my joke to, Managers, well, you should put out in April. You should put out all your Christmas stuff now. Right. There's everything flew off. The, right. 
Right. People didn't even care. They just figured they better buy this now because who knows if anything's going to be available later. It was almost like you said, you just bring it in the back door and no matter what it is, you can have the worst quality. You could, you know, you could probably sell Studebakers, you know, inside the car. You know. Edsel's. Edsel's. <laughs> Edsel's. Um, Edsel's. That was the one. I actually had a Studebaker Lark when I was in high school. The, um, I would, I, I, John. I will, I will, I will challenge you on on one thing you just said, though, because which is they didn't have to innovate. I actually think that most food retailers, and I can't, I'm not speaking specifically to Southern California here, but even just in terms of how they had to do things like click and collect and e-commerce stuff that they were, not, a lot of them were not doing beforehand, yeah. and even the ones who were doing had to do to a greater degree. I think food retailers were by and large more innovative in the past year than at a faster rate than ever before, I think it's because, but they didn't think of it as innovation. They thought of it as survival, but they were innovating and getting out of the, instead of doing, okay, we'll do a six month study with a, with a focus group and we'll study this thing up the yin yang. And, you know, and then we're only going to launch it when we know it's going to work, which is not actually an experiment. Um, yeah. They were doing this stuff fast. And if it didn't work, then they were trying something else because they had to. So I would challenge the notion that they weren't innovating. Um, yeah, I mean, there were true. There were areas, if you view it as a circle or a blog, there were areas that they pushed out, mm -hmm. um, which is should have been pushed out earlier or right. one time. I know we both have talked about that, that the center of the storm, right. most likely is going to be gone. The perimeter is what will stay. Um, I would agree with that, though. I see it from um, a different level, where is they then would guarantee to customers it'll be done in 45 minutes. Right. Workers were then told, skip break, you know, just don't worry about everything. I mean, it was, it's a mixture, it's a balance. Sure. Right? We, we know that. And um, I'm not sure that, I my sense is, and obviously from my vantage point is, the employees or the workers ability to do it is the last thing taken into consideration. It's sort of like, you know, I mean, I, we find the same thing in drugstores now where we fought with those for all stores with pharmacy. The priority is the vaccination. They have sometimes a three and four day back wait on the regular prescriptions. Right. Because, and they're not bringing any extra help in. It's just boom, 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 get these vaxes out. And they got in, you know, and sort of like, we'll worry about the labor aspect later. We just want to get these vaccinations out the door. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's my job was right. to, to think about that and to be aware of that. Um, I just don't think there was enough attention on this. And I, um, I'm, you know, I know, and I know you are too. I, I'm, I'm the heroism <clears throat> during this period, I think is just remarkable. When I would still would talk to him, there was still an element of pride. I mean, there was this fear on the one hand, it's like, my God, am I gonna infect my father who's living with us, you know, who's okay. diabetic? And then on the other hand, there was this pride about we're keeping our communities alive and just, I mean, they really still was every phone conversation, every Zoom call, every telephone town hall. Workers would almost apologize for feeling angry or mistreated. It's like, I want to do this. I want to go to work. I, I love, you know, Mrs. Costanza when she comes in. I, I need to know that she's okay. So they still have that, which we know is, is such a beautiful characteristic of of these essential workers is they still have the community it, you know they're like first responders which is what right. you know many respect and so that's the thing that um i've been most moved by is during this and the hell that they've gone through is they still stand up tall about we're vital we're the hub we're the ones keeping our communities alive that's what i mean i that's a takeaway that I'm just so impressed and honored to be able to do work, um, you know, and serve them. Yeah. Well, I, well, listen, and I will, uh, you know, I, it's interesting. One word you don't hear her, uh, hear bandied around right now very much is the word essential, right? And yet essential a year ago was a word we heard a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I can remember thinking and, and writing that, Hey, listen, if there, are, if there are essential workers in April of 2020, there actually were essential workers in April of 2019 as well. And that the companies that, I don't think there are a lot of them out there, 
that treat their employees as being essential um, pre-pandemic, and we'll do it post-pandemic, we're going to do the right thing during the pandemic. And, and, I, and I thought, and I did think that if you're not, if, 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 if essentialness, if that's a word, is, 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 is situational yeah. as opposed to cultural, you got a problem. And I'm not yeah. specifically referring to any retailer. No, I'm no, just no. in general. No, and I agree. And I actually, um, I, I mean, I agree with that 100% because when looking at that back in April, May, realized, especially in Southern California, which is probably true, the situation almost becomes part of the culture is that fires, there are pictures that, that I have of two years ago where you could see the flames lapping the hillside behind the store and the employees still in. Right. And they were like given toilet paper to wrap around their head, you know, over their mouth because the smoke was so bad. So I've seen it. We've seen it in fires. We've seen it um, in mudslides in the Santa Barbara area where horrific mudslides. We've seen it where there's been civil disturbances. Um, they stay. They are asked to stay at their post for all of the problems that our communities face whether they're external, natural, God made, punished, you know, punishing us, locusts even, though I haven't seen that recently. You wouldn't know you're describing, describing Southern California, which is supposed to be the promised land. Now, I live in Connecticut. We get a little snow in February. You know, yeah. we don't have, no mudslides, no fires, you know. I know. All right, let's talk, let's talk about mandating. Okay. Because um, I, 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 I essentially don't, I mean, I can't vouch for what you're saying. I mean, about in yeah. terms of the the, the companies, uh, but I'm totally on board that that treating your employees as essential and rewarding them in the right way made made absolutely sense, a lot of sense during the pandemic, as well as before the pandemic and after the pandemic. So we're we're very close to being on the same page there. Yeah. So let's talk about the mandate because my argument has been that. Uh, is that the word mandate really bothers me because I just think it's bad public policy. But so let me just, let, let me make sure that I understand it correctly. So mandate, a, 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 local, a mandate is when a local lawmaker, and it can be as big as Los Angeles City or Los Angeles County, or it can be as small as Bainbridge Island, right? Across Puget Sound from Seattle. They decide to legislate an hourly increase for a specific class of retail employee generally grocery workers, although not always just grocery yeah. workers. And there's usually some kind of qualifying set of standards, like the company has to have a certain number of stores or a certain number of employees, but usually that's nationwide, not just in the market. It depends, and, yeah. yeah. Right? And the increase yeah. is generally two, three, four dollars an hour. So am I mischaracterizing what a mandated um, hazard pay increase is? No, the only thing that's not mentioned is that it's for a limited duration. Right. And that duration um, shadows or falls within this specter of the pandemic, the emergency order. It's limited, but it's not in indexed, if that's the right word, in the yeah, sense that exactly. they may say it's 120 days, but there's nothing to stop them from, no. Um, no. Yeah, there's nothing to stop them from uh, renewing it, as opposed to, let's suppose that they said, okay, we're going to put this into place, and I don't know what the what I don't know what the um, the case numbers are. What are the daily case numbers in LA right now? Well, they actually were, when LA was the first iteration was as long as we're in the until we get to the yellow zone or right. whatever the zones, right? You know, okay. on the percentage. So but that was retreated from that because to make it I don't know more palatable that we'll just give you a precise um, period of time so you can budget it, 120 days, okay. and then it's over. Okay. So, but explain to me why it's good public policy for lawmakers to intercede in this way on one specific class of trade. I mean, why, why, is, the, why is the employee at, at, a, at a, um, a Vons or a Ralph's more at risk than an employee at Home Depot? Well, curious you say that, because the judge um, in denying um, Kroger's, one of Kroger's lawsuits. Up in Washington, right? Yeah, said, I don't have to go to Home Depot during the pandemic, but I sure as 
as hell have to go to Vons or Ralph's or whatever to get my toilet paper and milk. But that's and, John, those aren't numbers. That's a that I mean, that's a, that's an anecdotal and completely accurate representation of the reality. But if if um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the numbers are higher at. No, no, no. It doesn't the, mean no. I agree. But the question is, it goes to the essentialness or essentiality. Right. Well, let's just make up that word, whatever we okay. want. Make make a ger German essential Freuden or something, you know. Um, it is clear that the role of markets really do serve the community right. in, in a more, and I would say more vital than Home Depot. Totally. That's, right. And I'm so not that's saying, a, I'm not saying it's not more vital. I'm just saying I have not seen, and I and retailers I've talked to yeah. have not seen statistics showing that you're at any greater risk working at, at the checkout in a supermarket than you are working at the checkout in a, in a Home Depot, let's say. And I'm just using the Home Depot as an example, pick any place. And, they, and so they haven't seen the numbers and they'll tell, and, and they will say to me, and our internal numbers are certainly, are, are, are pretty good. I mean, we're, we've actually not had, you know, any deaths for X number of months or whatever it happens to be. So, but beyond that, so that's, so, I mean, I mean, I would have a problem with, with a legislatively mandated uh, increase anyway, but it's the one class of trade that just strikes me as being unfair. And the other thing is, is that, um, you know, I mean, none of these lawmakers are doing, are doing 120 day hero hazard pay for their firemen or their policemen because that's their money, <laughs> right? That's True. their taxpayers' money, and they may not get elected if they don't. If they if they do that, it's 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 easy to go give. I mean, comparatively easy to give away Kroger's money. True, though I would argue that if you look at it through a both racial, gender, and even economic lens, right. they're low paid grocery workers, and um, I guess I'm somewhat at fault are low paid work are largely low paid workers and we know that it's over two thirds are part time their their yearly income i would say pales but is much less than a firefighter or police officer and they've had to put up i would argue while they've been more at risk than a firefighter mm -hmm. and a police officer you know i mean no one's going to tell a cop no one's going to grab a cop's mask and try and pull it off no one's going to throw milk at a police officer, you know, out of their bag, it comes up and stops them. So the threats and the dangers and the what markets look like. I mean, it's better now, um, but just the the crowding and the social distancing there. I think the only one that I think is worse than us, and not in an aggregate sense, but in a not in a quantitative but a qualitative, are probably um, rest home workers. You know, mm -hmm. um, which those they're just almost a sealed container. Uh, I know their deaths are higher than ours, um, but they I don't have the public interaction. It's just the public. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people come through a store a day. You know, I would think you would. I would. I would be willing to bet uh, that you would get some pushback from whoever your counterpart is representing policemen or firemen. That that that. Em Grocery store workers are 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 more are more at risk. I'm just saying. I I would yeah. bet that they would. I mean, that's their that would be their job to push back on that. It's yeah, it's yeah. your job to do what you're doing. Um, I mean, I'm not saying they're not right. important. Right. Oh no, I understand. Um, the other thing that the w judge in Washington said, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing here, is that retailers have, just have too much profit, and I, I don't know that he said too much. But he said, but that was the implication of what he was saying. They make so much profit, they can afford to do this. Um, is that a, is it good public policy for legislators to be deciding how much profit corporations are allowed to make? They're not taxed. Uh, and listen, if you want to say they're making too much money and we're going to put a tax on them. Yeah. That's one thing. That's a different argument. I mean, if they, if I suppose if everyone wanted to tax all these retailers and then take that money and distribute it to frontline workers, 
that would have been a different issue. It would be a different discussion we'd be having than what you would you agree with that scenario? Um, I don't think I would, but I haven't thought of it. I, mean, I just came yeah, out. No, that either way. I'm not. I just. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would agree with that one either. But but um, but I'm just saying that would be a. It's a different argument. Taxation is a different argument than. It is, but but they're to quote Marshall, um, not not Thurgood John. Um, I mean, tax it, it's the power to destroy, right. right? Right. And I shouldn't be arguing saying this out loud, um, but is not raising wages or establishing wages that power that, that same you know you're basically determining how the company uses its resources so when we say a minimum wage we're saying a certain set of enterprises you're not going to be able to compete we're not going to give you a a charter or a license right. to operate because you can't operate you can't pay a minimum wage or I, overtime after 40 hours or health and safety or workers compensation all those are all wage aspects largely right. And I'm and I'll listen. I'm I'm not arguing against minimum wage. God knows. And I'm not I'm I'm not I'm not saying that at all. Um, uh, I mean that's a, I, that might be another conversation for another time. Right. I'm not at all because I think I I'm not sure that the minimum wage in uh, the federal minimum minimum wage, let's say in Arkansas, should be the same as it is in LA. I mean there's yeah. there's different places, but that's a different argument. Yeah. But in a lot of ways, as I'm I'm trying to work this through in my mind. Isn't isn't the isn't hazard pay mandate? Isn't it essentially taxation? Except it's never going through the government's fingers. Yeah, I mean, right? you could. Yeah, I mean, it I mean, is. It, well, it, it, it is. If you take out the word taxation, because I think people, um, the back, the hairs on the back of their neck go up. Right. You know, I, mean, I guess the question is, how do we decide what the configuration is of the economy within our communities, um, and in one part, the charter or the licensing is part of a, a community decision. It's like, you know, whether we're licensing about who gets to sell to whom, like liquor stores, we've mandated you who, who they can sell to. We've mandated what their operating hours can be, um, you know, and so we've communities reached in to an individual enterprise to sort of figure out what the proper configuration is to ensure that our communities are healthy and are served properly. And then when you do it around who can, who can receive it, who can buy, when they can buy, where you can set them up, how you set them up, um, I think that the question of, and the taxation of, of, that, of the operation, of our different operating costs, I think the question of, are those who do the work to be compensated as part of our community is called into question and is it is fair game to be looked at. It's like a living wage or a minimum wage. We do, I mean, unfortunately, restaurant workers um, in some respects, and I know agricultural workers were exempted from minimum wage. Now, some of it has this racist history, right. history with slavery, but um, so we've made certain decisions in certain industries. We'll say pharmacists can work through their breaks or essential, not essential, first responders are in fact the, while they're entitled to extra pay, they're also entitled to the employer violate um, break and lunch rest periods because you have to respond and you can't say, I'll get that fire after my 15 minute break. You know, um, we understand the realities. Yeah, but the, I mean, the thing about, um, the, again, the mandate is to me is it's, it is, it is both situational and completely unnuanced in the sense that um, if it, first of all, it takes away the ability for a retailer to differentiate itself by paying more money. Okay. On the one, right. Uh, because if you're paying, you know, because it, it, it seems to me that if, if I'm a retailer, if you and I both have stores yeah. And I want to pay myself, my, my employees, eighteen dollars an hour because I want to get a better, empl better employees, more motivated employees. This is basically discouraging me from doing that because if you're paying your folks fourteen dollars an hour, and yeah. I'm paying mine eighteen, now I've got to go to twenty-two, and you're going, you're only going to eighteen. You're right. And, That's right. And so, and, and twenty-two may be completely. I mean, that 22 may, uh, I mean, there would be retailers. I just can't, I mean, I can't afford to pay that. I mean, now that is essentially 
the argument that Kroger made in saying, hey, we're closing these stores because we weren't making money in them before. And if we have to give everybody a $4, in, for dollar, a $4, $4 per hour increase, these stores become completely unprofitable. That's what they said, though they've now recanted that. They said they were planning on closing them anyway. Um, it also turns out now that there are at least two of the, in the Los Angeles three, if not all three, had leases that were expired anyway and not renewed. And um, they're now going to go up for affordable housing and other development part of the, the gentrification. Okay. Okay, so, so so part of it was that I'm just saying, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. They, I no other. Why is the no other employer closed stores? Oh, it was a form of protest. Yeah, yeah. I'll buy that. It I'll, was, as I it say, it was it was it was Darth Vader going after Alderaan. <laughs> that's my that's well, my movie okay. clip. That's my movie. Clip. All right, that's that's that that's all right, but that's that's but. Okay, but let's, okay, but I, it was a form of saying, hey, listen, guys, if you're going to play hardball, we're, we can play hardball too. Yeah. How, but is, isn't that for them as a retailer? I mean, they don't have a lot of ways to protest. Uh, this may be a little inflammatory, but is, is closing a store under those circumstances any less a legitimate form of protest than erecting a picket line or going on strike? Good question. Let me just figure that out. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, you, you got to play the cards you're dealt. And they and that was the card they had. Those were the only cards they had to play. Well, they could have taken part in public hearing, right? And I guess, yeah, you're right. To a certain extent, I'm not, and I'm not sure that's, to me, that's beyond the pale. I mean, I do think that when you're chartered publicly, um, this goes into it with our next discussion will be about charter revocation. Um, you know, I think that there's a certain a presumption that you're subject to public authority. But they, I mean, but they were, it, yeah, subject to public authority is what, I mean, yes, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta maintain certain standards in terms of right. safety. You gotta, you gotta pay your people a certain minimum wage. You have above that, anything beyond that is up to you. You, was, you establish what your norms are going to be through collective bargaining with, with uh, a, a responsible um, uh, a union a union. Thank you. Um, Flattery will get you nowhere, but I agree 100%. Right? And I mean, the, gonna... all those things, right? You got to make sure the toilets are running. You got to make sure the water is clean. And, and if you're in the food business, you got to make sure you're doing all the food safety things. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting we need the wild, wild west. And I'm in favor of all that stuff. Right. It's the it's the for 120 days. We're going to mandate that you and nobody else have to increase these things. And again, it it, it just I'm just had trouble with the notion again because there are retailers who are paying their people more money who actually get now are being penalized for no, paying more those. Money. Yeah. No. And they don't have, by the way, and they don't have the ability, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not choosing a specific retailer, but if you're only operating 14, let's suppose you're operating 14 stores. Yeah. And one of them is marginal. One of them's on the bubble. It really is on the bubble, but you know, you, you, you want to keep it open. You think it's got a future, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be building housing a mile down the road. It's going to be, all of it's going to be good. So I know I got to hang up, but if I can just hang on for a year or two and break even, I'm, I'm okay. This actually makes me say, no, I, I can't, right? I'm not, I, I can't afford to be put in this position right now because I'm, I'm in, because I'm, maybe I'm a private company. I'm not public. There's no private public. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. right. And so suddenly I may have to close that store. So you're going to lose a hundred jobs. As opposed to as opposed to have people in the in those hundred people getting two three four dollars more an hour, and that's what that's what bothers me about the mandate. Is it is it's like they didn't and it. Oh, let me ask you the question this way. Yeah. How many how many public officials that you dealt with on this do you, do you think really understood retailing? I know you understand retailing. Someone, I came out of the slaughterhouse, so I'm not as good at, you know, as well versus others. You've been doing this a long time. I just think, yeah. you know, 
I've had conversations with public officials in other locations, and they don't understand me. What do you mean they make two? What do you mean they make three cents on the dollar? How is that possible? But you know. the fact, but nobody else closed, or even I mean, I've talked to some of the small operators. Right. Their their biggest problem with this was having their bookkeeper figure out how to how to do this. Right. Like it's like we then said you can wait two or three weeks. It's oh. like. I'm not arguing with you. Kroger did it because it could. Yes. I mean, I'm a, I, I, I don't even think Kroger would argue with that. I mean, they may no, not no. say it. Kroger now has backed off. You would be like this. Kroger now has backed off and said, um, okay, yeah, it really wasn't about that. And our suits were only because Walmart and Target weren't included, which they were included in LA. But it's sort of like, really, I don't think that's the only basis for your suit. I know it's, but see, I go back to, it's, I guess it's some of it about transitions and whatnot. I'm still, I'm really old school. I like the era or look towards when there were public markets and every, you know, the 265 largest cities in the country had market departments, public market departments. And they, you know, as you know, determined when they're to operate, the matters of cleanliness, and they even established prices for widows and those who were disabled who got a lower price, were afforded lower prices at these public markets than others. Now, obviously it was in the afternoon, so it would have been taken right. over. But it was like, that's an authority. It, to me, it's a public, it's similar to healthcare, housing, you know, and food or the, the triumvirate or the three-legged stool that every community needs in order to stay healthy and enable folks to enjoy its riches. And so, is public, the selling of public foodstuffs, I think it merits that attention. Don't you think, which I should turn into a question, right? Don't you think it merits enough attention and observation, control, whatever we want, to, monitoring to ensure that our communities are afforded them and those who work in those um, establishments similarly are rewarded um, for all the hidden, you talk about some of the hidden costs the employers have, these clerks had a number of hidden costs, extra extra clothing, extra trips to the laundry care, a whole set of stuff <clears throat> that they had to um, take care. I mean, they were many of them were taking public transportation, which wasn't exactly the greatest, you know, place to be. Listen, I mean, um, I, and listen, I think that I, I I would like to think that if I were running a, a business like that, that I would have I would have tried to understand the things that you're talking about and tried to and maybe and um and would have done my best if to figure out how to how to ameliorate some of those issues i mean i think i, I mean and i'm so i'm not i'm not yeah yeah so i'm not i'm not arguing that at all and again it goes back to what we talked about earlier right the whole notion of what's essential and what's not yeah you mean i mean if 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 a lot of my employees are struggling to take public transportation to where they work and there's no pub good public transportation, is there a way to deal with that? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's incumbent, especially now to figure that stuff out. Um, you know, Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I'm, I'm on board for all that stuff. Right. Um, but I think that the, da the danger is, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I'm in favor of the idea of communities determining pricing. I mean, I think that I think because yeah. I, I, I think that's basically not capitalism. And I mean, Jeff Bezos famously says, you know, your margin is my opportunity. And the pro and the thing is, especially in a place like L.A., right, where there's a lot of stores, is if somebody's not competitive, somebody else is going to step in and be competitive. I mean, if yeah. if there's a if there's a if there's a um, a, a Ralph's here that is overcharging or uh, under deliver or underperforming or under delivering in terms of service there's probably a vons within a within within a half a mile that can take advantage of that and turn it into a a, a differential advantage and so um and i think that's that's where i have i, I guess i i, I we, we have a disconnect on that why uh, the other thing that occurred to me when they did all this is that I would have thought that before I started mandating, if I were a public official or a retailer, uh, I, I mean, we're talking, we're having a conversation about um, a mandated hazard pay. 
I would have been a lot faster to say, could we please mandate vaccination vans going to every store in Southern California and, and vaccinating not just employees, but employees, partners, or spouses, because that's really important too. One being vaccinated doesn't, you, yes. you get both people vaccinated. I would have mandated that. I would have done that really, really, that would have been my first step. Not, not they haven't done it yet. Fair? No, I agree. I, I, um, Did that ever yes. come up as an, op as an option? Let's not do this. Let's do this first and see. Because suddenly if everybody's vaccinated, your, your numbers are down. People aren't at risk. You don't have... They're, they're not sitting with dealing. In other words, if you get $4 an hour and you haven't been back more an hour and you have, and you have um, not been vaccinated, you get COVID. I mean, now, right now, the death rate, well, the death rates are going up at the moment, but it's not as bad as it was. You're still getting COVID. Yeah. You get vaccinated and you get COVID. It's like a case of the flu by and large. Yeah, right. right? Agreed on that. We agreed. And I would have done, I would have done that first. Did that ever come up? I don't recall it coming up. I know we've had discussions with employers around um, vaccinations and it's, it was one of two, two um, those that had pharmacies within the store says we got to take care of it. We don't, we don't need, it's just fine. You know, that makes it easier though. They're, it's taken a while for them to get that protocol right. ready when they had the extras left over and who gets it and whatnot. We sort of were trying to look at that. And then, I've, as I mentioned to you earlier, we've had to undertake to run vaccination clinics out of our parking lot, um, two or three of the buildings, setting it up. And the employer said, yeah, that's okay. That's fine. It's like, oh, that's good. You know, and it's like, give us your list. We want to call through people. Um, and can you set aside time for people to, I, I agree, the vaccination, I mean, I don't even go before that testing. Right. Testing should have been, you know, we, they're, reluctance to test i don't understand where that came from you know but i agree that should have been i mean i think looking at the whole picture would have I also think this vaccination thing is such a mess i mean it is like you're on you're off you can't get through it is i don't know what it's like back east but out here is they've Actually, got some relatively smooth really I, you know i mean i have to say i mean i had a, i mean i um I mean, I had a really easy experience because for better or worse, I'm old enough that I got into a, you know, I got in, right. too. but my wife and my daughter, I mean, my wife's younger than I am. And my daughter's obviously a lot younger than I am as teachers. I mean, they, I mean, and there's a perfect example as teachers, they were said, we're going to, we're going to set up a vaccination clinic at, at, at the gym at town hall. And everybody's going to come on these days and get vaccinated. And two weeks later, you're all coming back and getting your second vaccination. And so, I mean, they really took care of, uh, you know, and that was a negotiated benefit with the union. I mean, yeah, so. it, it was, it was a mess out here because the vaccinations are coming. They're not coming. Who are they going? Are we, you know, and then there was this jumping in line in front of everybody. And it was just, well, I, I don't know if it's because of scale in California. I was say, in all fairness, I live in a little town in Connecticut. You're in Southern California. So it's a different, it's a different issue. Um, how do you think? I, I don't. I, you've been really generous with your time, so I want to. I want to. I want to wrap it up a little bit. But do you think? Because I mean, retailers I've talked to about this, they're pissed off. I'm mean, right about this. They're really angry about this. Um, I don't know when. When is your? When is the Southern California labor contract up? When is, have, is the is the is the is the um has the water been you know um tainted to the point where it's it going to create additional problems down the road? That's a good question. I mean, we're in the middle of the food for less, their warehouse, which we call their second class, you know, um, right. set of stores right now, um, took a strike vote, 90% voted um, to strike. Um, we'll see what we're meeting next week. So we'll see if that'll, I, I don't know if they've been, it'll be interesting to see um, how that goes. There's now the conversations with you might be different with us, largely, um, the mid-level ones are somewhat understanding. I mean, there's not a, you know, about it. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of, of, of next, obviously. Um, what is the, what is the next year? March of next year. So we're a year well, out. Less than a year. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, so we're starting to, to prepare, um, and talk to folks about it. Um, it is, I do think it's what, 
part of this is, I think, the health crisis, healthcare crisis in this country was that, you know, the last 20 of the last 30 years, instead of wage increases, it went to protecting, fighting off healthcare costs, right? right? And, and much of the, so if we had not had that, I'm sure the wages would be at, a, at an area where it, it's more, it's fair, you know, um, or, you know, um, so I don't, um, I don't know. That's a good question, Kevin. Just... I mean, you can, you can, I mean, you can tell the lines are being drawn. I mean, not just in Southern California. I mean, it was, it's in mean, FMI has just come out with this report, right? Saying that food retailers around the country invested $24 billion to respond to COVID, $12 billion in increases in payroll and incentive pay, 5 billion increases in benefits, non-monetary benefits and vaccine incentives, $1 billion, PPE, a billion dollars, cleaning and sanitation supplies, 3 billion, um, technology that's, online at delivery expenses, 1.5 billion. And that's uh, all, that's their, all retail employers? Uh, well, food industry, retail food industry. So they're, and they're saying that, and they come out with that. And then almost at simultaneously, I mean, Kroger has its investor conference yep. and makes the point that, you know, it's going to, it's going to increase its average associate wage to $16 an hour. Um, I mean, it's, it just seems to me that the, I, I Which, do these things in concert and have this conversation. I can't help but think in some ways um, the battle lines are, are being drawn. Right. I mean, that's no different than usual. No, they, those costs did go up, but I don't, and Kroger's report, their profit clear of all those expenses was $2.6 billion, a 50% increase. So that's not even counting the stock buybacks that they did. So it's not like, I agree their costs went up, but even more so was was their profit. That's that's the other context, which I think has to um yeah. But if I'm Rodney McMullen, my argument is listen, we need we need to be profitable. Those profits are at some point going to get plowed back into being competitive. And if we that allows us to keep our prices lower and and, and compete with Amazon, then yeah that's that's good i mean if it keep makes us viable i mean if we're a profitable company going forward and yeah our profits went up but here's the deal their profits aren't going to go they're co everybody's comps for 2021 are going to be awful because they're <laughs> right and they're all yep. going to and and they're pro and if you're a public company the odds are pretty good that you're going to hit get hit badly in your in terms of your stock price because some an analyst in new york is going to go well, wait a minute. Same last, story. Year, last year you had an eight percent increase. This year you what do you mean you're gonna have a one percent decrease? No, and the triple gonna... S, same store sales, right? Right. We had managers telling clerks in I said August, September, our sales are down compared to where they were in April. It's like, really? That's a good thing. <laughs> Workers are going, yes, yeah. that means I don't have to work 60 hours right. you know, this week. But um, I just I just think it's more complex that yeah, that profit is it is, it, it, it it's is. not a bad thing, especially in this industry where profit can be hard to come by. Yes, the, the other thing is, and I, I'll admit this is, it's also uneven. Right. So what do you do when um, you have Bezos who use, um, I guess it was not Bezos, it was the guy, but it was Mackey, the Whole Foods right. who said that unions were like a socially transmitted sexual disease, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, but we know Bezos is well, attitude. Just, I know that's just charming, isn't it? <laughs> is it? We know. So what? What? What is it when some employers afford workers' democracy work and bargain collectively to try and figure out a median point of some point when others don't? You have bottom feeders and those who are just adamantly ideologically, if not, you know, or whatever. That, that makes that first, but that makes that first set of employers preferred employers. Right. Yes, and, and I agree, and it's difficult. So it, that's the thing that I've always had when bargaining. When I had this thing, in, in, when I was bargaining packing house, and we were down five, ten percent of the packers were union, and the other was weren't. I mean, I'm fighting them, but I know out of the corner of my eye, ninety percent give the workers a fifty dollar bill to get injured because they're not paying workers comp. I mean, these are the non-union ones, right? They're hiding, operating out of some, tr and it's like they got to compete with them, and that's the same. What you're arguing is. Kroger, Albert Bonds, you know, all of them have got to compete. And that's the problem when, when things are uneven. 
right. is that how do you find equity, much less, you know, make it a, a level playing field, which was when I grew up, you know, it was 90% union. And then you just, right. it was people decided based on the logo, the color of the logo or whatever, you decided where to shop. It wasn't costs. Right. But I, I guess, and again, and I, I'm, I'm enough of a capitalist, and I have members of the Morning Newsbeat audience who think I'm a total socialist. Uh, but um, I'm not one of them. I'll just let you know. <laughs> but, you know, that's capitalism, right? I mean, some it people is. pay more than others. People, ch people charge more than others. Yep. I mean, right. and I, as a consumer, make a decision. Am I going to, am I going to go to Vons? Am I going to go to Food for Less? Am I going to go to um, Bristol Farms or Gelson's? Right. I mean, I've got those choices. And um, but the basis should be they're they're not not their labor costs that so and so is able to not pay the labor costs and therefore charge lower prices. Well, but again, I mean, if they all have same, a minimum, right? They, uh, we're not. I'm not arguing getting rid of minimum wage. I'm not. I, I think no, no. And, and I'm agreeing before. with your earlier point right. where what do you do with summer eighteen and summer right. fourteen? That that you know, there is there's that problem, and I don't know, you know. So let's end on a, on a, on a semi-hopeful note. Okay. So going forward, yeah. is there, because you're going a year from now, well, less than 10 months from now, you're going to be hip deep in negotiations and hopefully not doing them virtually, right? I mean, hopefully yeah. not doing yeah. them by Zoom. But it's very tough to enough. pound on the table virtually right. and, and impress an employer. But what is there low hanging fruit for that you think that retailers could offer to you and your members that would not significantly affect, I, I'm, I'm sort of asking you to negotiate a morning news feed, which is probably not fair, but I'm gonna yeah. do it anyway. Is there something that you think that they should consider looking at yeah. that would be, have a positive impact on your members without having a negative impact on their operations. Is there something you're so, there? You're, you're so smart about trying to figure out the high note at the end on this thing. <laughs> yes. And let me one subject, which is a little bit, I think the pandemic um, accentuated and highlighted concerns is the future of work, the future of grocery work. I think that's an area which they've yet to really reach across the table. We've tried, Let's figure out the future of work together. There may, you know, in terms of upskilling, skilling the workers. I mean, with one model we've talked about was if the center of the store is largely gone, you're gonna buy your, you're not gonna squeeze the Charmin anymore, you're gonna buy it online, right? All that the hard stuff. That in fact, clerks become nutritionists. They're they're conscious of, you know, Mr. Cook, good to see you. I noticed you had pasta last week. If you check over in the meat department. Yeah. They've got some veal that actually goes really good, you know, that they, but I'm a little worried about your, your cholesterol. So in fact, we've got some new mango, whatever, you know what I mean? I mean, it's right. like, that in fact, it's a concierge that right. you go to, you'll be going to a market for a different reason than we went to before. And I think that's a thing where looking forward five, what I thought was maybe 10 years is probably three to five, right? Exactly. How is this going to change? How is the, the e-commerce going to be? And how can we protect and ensure that because the other phenomenon that's going on, which is subject for our next discussion is this whole question of independent contractors and who's an employee, yeah. which is also, I mean, it's been community decided. Yeah. I think that's an area where it's low, for, that we can figure this out together in terms of whether it's an apprenticeship program for the store, developing those skills, because the inside of the store is gonna change. I mean, we've seen it, Amazon for better, for worse, worse I would say, but you know, cashierless, markets right. largely and so what do you how do you make how do we someone's got to take this by the figure out this transition i mean what i was talking about before about public markets the transition away from that to brick and mortar was not completely figured out yeah I, this is even more important how do we figure out this transition in a way that protects our community and the employee i mean the other thing what what I, what I found on grocery was their public participation, at least in the United stores, was greater because um, they they voted more often, the more were registered. The question of, of racial understanding, because the seniority, you weren't just from South LA, you also came from the Valley, you know, and people, when you work together, you understand things together. The vitality, the hub that markets play 
can continue, but we've got to be thinking together about how to do that. And that's the thing about workplace democracy is it's the time to have a conversation. It affords us the opportunity to have a conversation. I think that's I, know, a, yeah. I think that's really smart. I think that they it seems to me that there's um and you don't need me to tell you it's smart, but I think it is because I mean it's because I think it's the there are certain things that both parties sort of have to be willing to put away you know the assumptions of the past when talking about it. I mean, because I mean, beyond the point of independent contractors, you know, if, if retailers are are are, are going to get rid of their center store, well, that's a lot of jobs that are going to go away. And if they're going to outsource a lot of that stuff to the Instacarts of the world, well, those are jobs are going away. And I mean, you want to protect those jobs, but they want to figure, but the retailer wants to figure it. Well, yeah, we want to protect the job. We'd like to protect the jobs too, but not if we can drop, we can, you know, drop X number of dollars to our bottom line. I mean, it just seems to me at some level, you all have to say, you know, you all have to sort of say, okay, let's, it's almost like, uh, you know, um, uh, zero sum marketing, uh, budgeting, right? Yeah. Let's start from yeah. the very beginning and figure out how do we build a new model going forward? Yeah, I agree. It's like SimCity, you yeah. know, it's, it's sort of like what we did with cannabis. Yeah. When we developed that industry, it's like, okay, how do you develop an industry that was illegal before in a way that protects the community and the employees and affords them a profit. All I gotta say is good luck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Because because, because that, that, that sounds a, it sounds a lot easier for you and, and, and me to talk about it now, but I, I think getting there is hard. Listen, John, I I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you doing this um and willing to sort of engage in the conversation. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, you, you, you know your, your, your candor is appreciated. I'm sure I'm going to get an email from folks saying, you know, uh, I, you know, the following three things, but I, listen, I appreciate you doing it. And I hope we can have the conversation to get going forward. I think this is right. valuable. So thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Really appreciate it. Take care. Stay safe. Too. All right.